This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Natural History of Selborne by Gilbert White. Letters to Thomas Pennant, Esquire, numbers seven to thirteen. Letter seven. Though large herds of deer do much harm to the neighbourhood, yet the injury to the morals of the people is of more moment than the loss of their crops. The temptation is irresistible, for most men are sportsmen by constitution, and there is such an inherent spirit for hunting in human nature, as scarce any inhibitions can restrain. Hence, towards the beginning of this century, all this country was wild about deer-stealing. Unless he was a hunter, as they affected to call themselves, no young person was allowed to be possessed of manhood or gallantry. The Waltham blacks at length committed such enormities that government was forced to interfere with that severe and sanguinary act called the Black Act, which now comprehends more felonies than any law that ever was framed before. And therefore a late bishop of Winchester, when urged to restock Waltham Chase, refused, from a motive worthy of a prelate, replying that it had done mischief enough already. Footnote by Gilbert White. This chase remains unstocked to this day. The bishop was Dr. Hoadley. End footnote. Our old race of deer-stealers are hardly extinct yet. It was but a little while ago that over their ale they used to recount the exploits of their youth, such as watching the pregnant hind to her lair and when the calf was dropped, paring its feet with a penknife to the quick, to prevent its escape, till it was large and fat enough to be killed. The shooting at one of their neighbours with a bullet in a turnip field by moonshine, mistaking him for a deer, and the losing a dog in the following extraordinary manner. Some fellows, suspecting that a calf new fallen was deposited in a certain spot of thick fern, went with a lurcher to surprise it, when the parent hind rushed out of the brake, and taking a vast spring with all her feet close together, pitched upon the neck of the dog, and broke it short in two. Another temptation to idleness and sporting was a number of rabbits, which possessed all the hillocks and dry places. But these being inconvenient to the huntsmen, on account of their burrows, when they came to take away the deer, they permitted the country people to destroy them all. Such forests and wastes when their allurements to irregularities are removed, are of considerable service to neighbourhoods that verge upon them, by furnishing them with peat and turf for their firing, with fuel for the burning their lime, and with ashes for their grasses, and by maintaining their geese and their stock of young cattle at little or no expense. The manor farm of the parish of Greatham has an admitted claim, I see, by an old record taken from the Tower of London, of turning all livestock on the forest, at proper seasons, bidendibus exceptis. Author's footnote. For the privilege, the owner of that estate used to pay to the king annually seven bushels of oats. End footnote. The reason, I presume, why sheep are excluded, is because, being such close grazers, they would pick out all the finest grasses, and hinder the deer from thriving. Author's footnote. In the halt, where a full stock of fallow deer has been kept up till lately, no sheep are admitted to this day. End footnote. Though to burn on any waste between Candlemas and Midsummer any grig, ling, heath and furs, goss or fern, is punishable with whipping and confinement in the House of Correction, by statute four and five, William and Mary's, yet in this forest about March or April according to the dryness of the season, such vast heath-fires are lighted up, that they often get to a masterless head, and catching the hedges have sometimes been communicated to the underwoods, woods, and coppices, where great damage has ensued. The plea for these burnings is that, when the old coat of heath, etc., is consumed, young will sprout up, and afford much tender browse for cattle. But where there is large old firs, the fire following the roots consumes the very ground, so that for hundreds of acres nothing is to be seen but smother and desolation, the whole circuit round looking like the cinders of a volcano, and, the soil being quite exhausted, 
no traces of vegetation are to be found for years. These conflagrations, as they take place usually with a northeast or east wind, much annoy this village with their smoke, and often alarm the country, and once in particular I remember that a gentleman who lives beyond Andover, coming to my house, when he got on the downs between that town and Winchester, at twenty-five miles' distance, was surprised much with smoke and a hot smell of fire, and concluded that Ulresford was in flames, but when he came to that town he then had apprehensions for the next village, and so on, to the end of his journey. On two of the most conspicuous eminences of this forest stand two arbours or bowers, made of the boughs of oaks, the one called Walden Lodge, the other Brimstone Lodge. These the keepers renew annually on the feast of St. Barnabas, taking the old materials for a perquisite. The farm called Blackmoor in this parish is obliged to find the posts and brushwood for the former, while the farms at Greatham, in rotation, furnish for the latter and are all enjoined to cut and deliver the materials at the spot. This custom I mention because I look upon it to be of very remote antiquity. Letter 8 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire On the verge of the forest, as it is now circumscribed, are three considerable lakes, two in Oak Hanger, of which I have nothing particular to say, and one called Bins or Beans Pond, which is worthy the attention of a naturalist or a sportsman. For, being crowded at the upper end with willows, and with the Carex caspitosa, it affords such a safe and pleasing shelter to wild ducks, teals, snipes, etc., that they breed there. Footnote by the author. I mean that sort of Carex which, rising into tall hassocks, is called by the foresters turrets. End footnote. In the winter this covert is also frequented by foxes, and sometimes by pheasants, and the bogs produce many curious plants. Author's footnote. For which, consult letter 41 to Mr. Barrington. End footnote. Note. In the beginning of the summer, 1787, the royal forests of Wallamer and Holt were measured by persons sent down by government. End note. By a perambulation of Walmer Forest and the Holt, made in 1635, and in the eleventh year of Charles I, which now lies before me, it appears that the limits of the former are much circumscribed, for to say nothing on the farther side, with which I am not so well acquainted, the bounds on this side, in old times, came into Binswood, and extended to the ditch of Wardleham Park, in which stands the curious mount called King John's Hill and Lodge Hill and to the verge of Hartley Mordwit, called Mordwit Hatch, comprehending also Short Heath, Oak Hanger, and Oak Woods, a large district, now private property, though once belonging to the royal domain. It is remarkable that the term purlieu is never once mentioned in this long roll of parchment. It contains, besides the perambulation, a rough estimate of the value of the timbers, which were considerable, growing at that time in the district of the Halt, and enumerates the officers, superior and inferior, of those joint forests, for the time being, and their ostensible fees and perquisites. In those days, as at present, there were hardly any trees in Walmer Forest. Within the present limits of the forest are three considerable lakes, Hogmer, Cranmer, and Walmer, all of which are stocked with carp, tench, eels, and perch. But the fish do not thrive well, because the water is hungry, and the bottoms are a naked sand. A circumstance respecting these ponds, though by no means peculiar to them, I cannot pass over in silence, and that is, that instinct by which, in summer all the kine, whether oxen, cows, calves, or heifers, retire constantly to the water during the hotter hours, where, being more exempt from flies, and inhaling the coolness of that element, some belly-deep and some only to mid-leg, they ruminate and solace themselves from about ten in the morning till four in the afternoon, and then return to their feeding. During this great proportion of the day they drop much dung, in which insects nestle, and so supply food for the fish, which would be poorly subsisted but from this contingency. Thus nature, who is a great economist, converts the recreation of one animal to the support of another. 
Thompson, who was a nice observer of natural occurrences, did not let this pleasing circumstance escape him. He says in his summer, A various group the herds and flocks compose, on the grassy bank, some ruminating lie, while others stand, half in the flood, and often bending, sip the circling surface. Walmer Pond, so called, I suppose, for eminence sake, is a vast lake for this part of the world, containing in its whole circumference two thousand six hundred and forty-six yards, or very near a mile and a half. The length of the north-west and opposite side is about seven hundred and four yards, and the breadth of the south-west end about four hundred and fifty-six yards. This measurement, which I caused to be made with good exactness, gives an area of about sixty-six acres, exclusive of a large irregular arm at the northeast corner, which we did not take into the reckoning. On the face of this expanse of waters, and perfectly secure from fowlers, lie all day long in the winter season vast flocks of ducks, teals, and widgeons of various denominations, where they preen and solace and rest themselves, till towards sunset when they issue forth in little parties, for in their natural state they are all birds of the night, to feed in the brooks and meadows, returning again with the dawn of the morning. Had this lake an arm or two more, and were it planted round with thick covert, for now it is perfectly naked, it might make a valuable decoy. Yet neither its extent, nor the clearness of its water, nor the resort of various and curious fowls, nor its picturesque groups of cattle, can render this mere so remarkable as the great quantity of coins that were found in its bed about forty years ago. But, as such discoveries more properly belong to the antiquities of this place, I shall suppress all particulars for the present, till I enter professedly on my series of letters respecting the more remote history of this village and district. Letter 9. To Thomas Pennant, Esquire. By way of supplement, I shall trouble you once more on this subject, to inform you that Walmer, with her sister forest Ailes Holt, alias Alice Holt, as it is called in old records, is held by grant from the Crown for a term of years. The grantees that the author remembers are Brigadier General Emmanuel Scroop Howe and his lady Ruperta, who was a natural daughter of Prince Rupert by Margaret Hughes, a Mr. Mordaunt of the Peterborough family, who married a dowager Lady Pembroke, Henry Bilson Legg and Lady, and now Lord Storwell, their son. The lady of General Howe lived to an advanced age, long surviving her husband, and at her death left behind her many curious pieces of mechanism of her father's constructing, who was a distinguished mechanic and artist, as well as warrior, and among the rest a very complicated clock, lately in possession of Mr. Elmer, the celebrated game-painter at Farnham, in the county of Surrey. Author's footnote. This prince, the father of General Howe's lady, was the inventor of Mezzo Tinto. End footnote. Though these two forests are only parted by a narrow range of enclosures, yet no two soils can be more different. For the halt consists of a strong loam, of a miry nature, carrying a good turf and abounding with oaks that grow to be large timber, while Walmer is nothing but a hungry, sandy, barren waste. The former, being all in the parish of Binstead, is about two miles in extent from north to south, and near as much from east to west, and contains within it many woodlands and lawns, and the great lodge where the grantees reside, and a smaller lodge called Goose Green, and is abutted on by the parishes of Kingsley, Frincham, Farnham, and Bentley, all of which have right of common. One thing is remarkable that though the halt has been of old well stocked with fallow deer, unrestrained by any pales or fences more than a common hedge, yet they were never seen within the limits of Walmer, nor were the red deer of Walmer ever known to haunt the thickets or glades of the halt. At present the deer of the halt are much thinned and reduced by the night hunters, who perpetually harass them in spite of the efforts of numerous keepers, and the severe penalties that have been put in force against them as often as they have been detected, and rendered liable to the lash of the law. 
neither fines nor imprisonment can deter them so impossible is it to extinguish the spirit of sporting which seems to be inherent in human nature general howe turned out some german wild boars and sows in his forests to the great terror of the neighbourhood and at one time a wild bull or buffalo but the country rose upon them and destroyed them a very large fall of timber consisting of about one thousand oaks has been cut this spring that is seventeen eighty four in the holt forest one fifth of which it is said belongs to the grantee lord stoyle he lays claim also to the lop and top but the poor of the parishes of binstead and frincham bentley and kingsley assert that it belongs to them and assembling in a riotous manner have actually taken it all away one man who keeps a team has carried home for his share forty stacks of wood forty-five of these people his lordship has served with actions these trees which were very sound and in high perfection were winter cut that is in february and march before the bark would run in old times the halt was estimated to be eighteen miles computed measure from water carriage that is from the town of chertsey on the thames but now it is not half that distance since the way is made navigable up to the town of godalming in the county of surrey letter ten to thomas pennant esq august the fourth seventeen sixty seven it has been my misfortune never to have had any neighbours whose studies have led them towards the pursuit of natural knowledge so that for want of a companion to quicken my industry and sharpen my attention i have made but slender progress in a kind of information to which i have been attached from my childhood as to swallows hirundines rustici being found in a torpid state during the winter in the isle of wight or any part of this country i never heard any such account worth attending to but a clergyman of an inquisitive turn assures me that when he was a great boy some workmen in pulling down the battlements of a church tower early in the spring found two or three swifts hirundines apodes among the rubbish which were at first appearance dead but on being carried towards the fire revived he told me that out of his great care to preserve them he put them in a paper bag and hung them by the kitchen fire where they were suffocated another intelligent person has informed me that while he was a schoolboy at brighthelmstone in sussex a great fragment of the chalk cliff fell down one stormy winter on the beach and that many people found swallows among the rubbish but on my questioning him whether he saw any of these birds himself to my no small disappointment he answered me in the negative but that others assured him that they did young broods of swallows began to appear this year on july the eleventh and young martins hirundines urbici were then fledged in their nests both species will breed again once for i see by my fauna of last year that young broods come forth so late as september the eighteenth are not these late hatchings more in favour of hiding than migration nay some young martins remained in their nests last year so late as september the twenty ninth and yet they totally disappeared with us by the fifth of october how strange is it that the swift which seems to live exactly the same life with the swallow and house martin should leave us before the middle of august invariably while the latter stay often till the middle of october and once i saw numbers of house martins on the seventh of november the martins and redwing field fairs were flying in sight together an uncommon assemblage of summer and winter birds a little bird it is either a species of the eolorda trivialis or rather perhaps of the motacilla troculus still continues to make a sibilous shivering noise in the tops of tall woods the stoparola of ray for which we have as yet no name in these parts is called in your zoology the flycatcher there is one circumstance characteristic of this bird which seems to have escaped observation and that is that it takes its stand on the top of some stake or post from whence it springs forth on its prey catching a fly in the air and hardly ever touching the ground but returning still to the same stand for many times together i perceive there are more than one species of the motacilla troculus mr durham supposes in ray's philosophical letters that he has discovered three in these there is again an instance of some very common birds 
that have as yet no English name. Mr. Stillingfleet makes a question whether the black cap, Motacilla atricapilla, be a bird of passage or not. I think there is no doubt of it, for in April, in the very first fine weather, they come trooping all at once into these parts, but are never seen in the winter. They are delicate songsters. Numbers of snipes breed every summer in some moory ground on the verge of this parish. It is very amusing to see the cockbird on wing at that time, and to hear his piping and humming notes. I have had no opportunity yet of procuring any of those mice which I mentioned to you in town. The person that brought me the last says they are plenty in harvest, at which time I will take care to get more, and will endeavour to put the matter out of doubt whether it be a nondescript species or not. I suspect much there may be two species of water-rats. Ray says, and Linnaeus after him, that the water-rat is web-footed behind. Now, I have discovered a rat on the banks of our little stream that is not web-footed, and yet is an excellent swimmer and diver. It answers exactly to the Mus Amphibius of Linnaeus, which he says, Natat in fossis et urinator, reader's note, swims in holes and is a diver. End of reader's note. I should be glad to procure one, Plantis palmatis. Linnaeus seems to be in a puzzle about his Mus Amphibius, and to doubt whether it differs from his Mus Terrestris, which, if it be, as he allows, the Mus Agrestis Capite Grandi Brachiuros of Ray, reader's note, wild mouse with a large head and a short snout, end of reader's note, is widely different from the water rat, both in size, make, and manner of life. As to the falco, which I mentioned in town, I shall take the liberty to send it down to you in Wales, presuming on your candour that you will excuse me if it should appear as familiar to you as it is strange to me. Though mutilated, qualem dices antihac fuisse, tales cum sint reliquiae. Reader's note. You will tell what it was like from the character of its remains. End reader's note. It haunted a marshy piece of ground in quest of wild ducks and snipes but when it was shot had just knocked down a rook, which it was tearing in pieces. I cannot make it answer to any of our English hawks, neither could I find any like it at the curious exhibition of stuffed birds in spring gardens. I found it nailed up at the end of a barn, which is the countryman's museum. The parish I live in is a very abrupt, uneven country, full of hills and woods, and therefore full of birds. Letter 11 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire, Selborne, September the ninth, 1767. It will not be without impatience that I shall wait for your thoughts with regard to the falco, as to its weight, breadth, etc. I wish I had set them down at the time, but to the best of my remembrance it weighed two pounds and eight ounces, and measured from wing to wing thirty-eight inches. Its sear and feet were yellow, and the circle of its eyelids bright yellow. As it had been killed some days, and the eyes were sunk, I could make no good observation on the colour of the pupils and the irides. The most unusual birds I ever observed in these parts were a pair of hoopoes, upupa, which came several years ago in the summer, and frequented an ornamented piece of ground which joins to my garden for some weeks. They used to march about in a stately manner, feeding in the walks, many times in the day, and seemed disposed to breed in my outlet but were frightened and persecuted by idle boys, who would never let them be at rest. Three gross beaks, Loxia cockathrostes, appeared some years ago in my fields, in the winter, one of which I shot. Since that, now and then one is occasionally seen in the same dead season. A crossbill, Loxia curvirostra, was killed last year in this neighbourhood. Our streams, which are small, and rise only at the end of the village, yield nothing but the bull's head or miller's thumb, Gobius fluviatilis capitatus, the trout, Trutta fluviatilis, the eel, anguilla, the lampern, Lampitra parca et fluviatilis, and the stickleback, Pisciculus aculeatus. We are twenty miles from the sea, and almost as many from a great river, and therefore see but little of seabirds. As to wild fowls, we have a few teams of ducks bred in the moors where the snipes breed, 
and multitudes of widgeons and teals in hard weather frequent our lakes in the forest. Having some acquaintance with a tame brown owl, I find that it casts up the fur of mice, and the feathers of birds, in pellets, after the manner of hawks. When full, like a dog, it hides what it cannot eat. The young of the barn owl are not easily raised, as they want a constant supply of fresh mice, whereas the young of the brown owl will eat indiscriminately all that is brought, snails, rats, kittens, puppies, magpies, and any kind of carrion or offal. The house martins have eggs still, and squab young. The last swift I observed was about the twenty-first of August. It was a straggler. Redstarts, flycatchers, white throats, and reguli non cristati still appear, but I have seen no black caps lately. I forgot to mention that I once saw in Christ Church College Quadrangle in Oxford, on a very sunny, warm morning, a house martin flying about and settling on the parapet so late as the twentieth of November. At present I know only two species of bats, the common Vespertilio murinus and the Vespertilio auritus. I was much entertained last summer with a tame bat, which would take flies out of a person's hand. If you gave it anything to eat, it brought its wings round before the mouth, hovering and hiding its head in the manner of birds of prey when they feed. The adroitness it showed in shearing off the wings of the flies, which were always rejected, was worthy of observation, and pleased me much. Insects seemed to be most acceptable, though it did not refuse raw flesh when offered, so that the notion that bats go down chimneys and gnaw men's bacon seems no improbable story. While I amused myself with this wonderful quadruped, I saw it several times confute the vulgar opinion that bats, when down on a flat surface, cannot get on the wing again, by rising with great ease from the floor. It ran, I observed, with more dispatch than I was aware of, but in a most ridiculous and grotesque manner. Bats drink on the wing, like swallows, by sipping the surface as they play over pools and streams. They love to frequent waters, not only for the sake of drinking, but on account of insects, which are found over them in the greatest plenty. As I was going some years ago, pretty late, in a boat from Richmond to Sunbury, on a warm summer's evening, I think I saw myriads of bats between the two places. The air swarmed with them all along the Thames, so that hundreds were in sight at a time. Letter 12 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire, November the 4th, 1767 Sir, it gave me no small satisfaction to hear that the falco turned out an uncommon one. I must confess that I should have been better pleased to have heard that I had sent you a bird that you had never seen before, but that, I find, would be a difficult task. Footnote. This hawk proved to be the falco peregrinus, a variety. End note. I have procured some of the mice mentioned in my former letters, a young one and a female with young, both of which I have preserved in brandy. From the colour, shape, size, and manner of nesting, I make no doubt but that the species is nondescript. They are much smaller and more slender than the Mus domesticus medius of Ray, and have more of the squirrel or dormouse colour. Their belly is white. A straight line along their sides divides the shades of their back and belly. They never enter into houses, are carried into ricks and barns with the sheaves, abound in harvest, and build their nests amidst the straws of the corn, above the ground, and sometimes in thistles. They breed as many as eight at a litter, in a little round nest, composed of the blades of grass or wheat. One of these nests I procured this autumn, most artificially plaited, and composed of the blades of wheat, perfectly round and about the size of a cricket-ball, with the aperture so ingeniously closed that there was no discovering to what part it belonged. It was so compact and well filled that it would roll across the table without being discomposed, though it contained eight little mice that were naked and blind. As this nest was perfectly full, how could the dam come at her litter respectively so as to administer a teat to each? Perhaps she opens different places for that purpose, adjusting them again when the business is over. But she could not possibly be contained herself in the ball with her young, which moreover would be daily increasing in bulk. This wonderful procreant cradle, an elegant instance of the efforts of instinct, was found in a wheat-field, 
suspended in the head of a thistle. A gentleman, curious in birds, wrote me word that his servant had shot one last January, in that severe weather, which he believed would puzzle me. I called to see it this summer, not knowing what to expect, but the moment I took it in hand I pronounced it the male garrulus bohemicus, or German silk-tail, from the five peculiar crimson tags or points which it carries at the end of five of the short remiges. It cannot, I suppose, with any propriety be called an English bird, and yet I see by Ray's philosophical letters that great flocks of them, feeding upon whores, appeared in this kingdom in the winter of 1685. The mention of whores put me in mind that there is a total failure of that wild fruit, so conducive to the support of many of the winged nation. For the same severe weather late in the spring, which cut off all the produce of the more tender and curious trees, destroyed also that of the more hardy and common. Some birds haunting with the missile thrushes and feeding on the berries of the yew-trees, which answered to the description of the marula toquata or ring ousel, were lately seen in this neighbourhood. I employed some people to procure me a specimen, but without success. See letter twenty. Query. Might not canary birds be naturalised to this climate, providing their eggs were put in the spring into the nests of some of their congeners, as goldfinches, greenfinches, etc.? Before winter, perhaps, they might be hardened, and able to shift for themselves. About ten years ago I used to spend some weeks yearly at Sunbury, which is one of those pleasant villages lying on the Thames near Hampton Court. In the autumn I could not help being much amused with those myriads of the swallow kind which assemble in those parts. But what struck me most was that from the time they began to congregate, forsaking the chimneys and houses, they roosted every night in the osier beds of the eights of that river. Now this resorting towards that element at that season of the year seems to give some countenance to the northern opinion, strange as it is, of their retiring under water. A Swedish naturalist is so much persuaded of that fact that he talks in his calendar of flora as familiarly of the swallows going under water in the beginning of September as he would of his poultry going to roost a little before sunset. An observing gentleman in London writes me word that he saw a house martin on the twenty-third of last October flying in and out of its nest in the borough, and I myself on the twenty-ninth of last October, as I was travelling through Oxford, saw four or five swallows hovering round and settling on the roof of the county hospital. Now is it likely that these poor little birds, which perhaps had not been hatched but a few weeks, should at that late season of the year, and from so midland a county, attempt a voyage to Goree or Senegal, almost as far as the equator. I acquiesce entirely in your opinion that, though most of the swallow kind may migrate, yet that some do stay behind and hide with us during the winter. As to the short-winged, soft-billed birds, which come trooping in such numbers in the spring, I am at a loss even what to suspect about them. I watched them narrowly this year, and saw them abound till about Michaelmas, when they appeared no longer. Subsist they cannot openly among us, and yet elude the eyes of the inquisitive, and as to their hiding no man pretends to have found any of them in a torpid state in the winter. But with regard to their migration, what difficulties attend that supposition, that such feeble bad flyers, who the summer long never flit but from hedge to hedge, should be able to traverse vast seas and continents in order to enjoy milder seasons amidst the regions of Africa. Letter 13 to Thomas Pennant, Esquire, Selborne, January the 22nd, 1768. Sir, as in one of your former letters you expressed the more satisfaction from my correspondence on account of my living in the most southerly county, so now I may return the compliment, and expect to have my curiosity gratified by your living much more to the north. For many years past I have observed that towards Christmas vast flocks of chaffinches have appeared in the fields, many more, I used to think, than could be hatched in any one neighbourhood. But when I came to observe them more narrowly, 
I was amazed to find that they seemed to be almost all hens. I communicated my suspicions to some intelligent neighbours, who, after taking pains about the matter, declared that they also thought them all mostly females, at least fifty to one. This extraordinary occurrence brought to my mind the remark of Linnaeus, that before winter all their hen chaffinches migrate through Holland into Italy. Now I want to know, from some curious person in the north, whether there are any large flocks of these finches with them in the winter, and of which sex they mostly consist. For from such intelligence one might be able to judge whether our female flocks migrate from the other end of the island, or whether they come over to us from the continent. We have, in the winter, vast flocks of the common linnets, more, I think, than can be bred in any one district. These, I observe, when the spring advances, assemble on some tree in the sunshine, and, and join all in a gentle sort of chirping, as if they were about to break up their winter quarters, and betake themselves to their proper summer homes. It is well known, at least, that the swallows and the field fairs do congregate, with a gentle twittering, before they make their respective departure. You may depend on it that the bunting, Emberitza miliaria, does not leave this country in the winter. In January 1767 I saw several dozen of them, in the midst of a severe frost, among the bushes on the downs near Andover. In our woodland-enclosed district it is a rare bird. Wagtails, both white and yellow, are with us all the winter. Quails crowds to our southern coast, and are often killed in numbers by people that go on purpose. Mr. Stillingfleet, in his Tracts, says that if the wheat here, Enanthe, does not quit England, it certainly shifts places, for about harvest they are not to be found, where there was before great plenty of them. This well accounts for the vast quantities that are caught about that time on the South Downs near Lewis, where they are esteemed a delicacy. There have been shepherds, I have been credibly informed, that have made many pounds in a season by catching them in traps, and though such multitudes are taken, I never saw, and I am well acquainted with those parts, above two or three at a time, for they are never gregarious. They may perhaps migrate in general, and for that purpose draw towards the coast of Sussex in autumn. But that they do not all withdraw, I am sure, because I see a few stragglers in many counties at all times of the year, especially about warrens and stone quarries. I have no acquaintance at present among the gentlemen of the navy, but have written to a friend who was a sea chaplain in the late war, desiring him to look into his minutes with respect to birds that settled on their rigging during their voyage up or down the channel. What Hasselquist says on that subject is remarkable. There were little short-winged birds frequently coming on board his ship all the way from our channel quite up to the Levant, especially before squally weather. What you suggest with regard to Spain is highly probable. The winters of Andalusia are so mild that in all likelihood, the soft-billed birds that leave us at that season may find insects sufficient to support them there. Some young man possessed of fortune, health, and leisure should make an autumnal voyage into that kingdom, and should spend a year there, investigating the natural history of that vast country. Mr. Willoughby passed through that kingdom on such an errand, but he seems to have skirted along in a superficial manner, and an ill humour, being much disgusted at the rude, dissolute manners of the people. I have no friend left now at Sunbury to apply to about the swallows roosting on the ayats of the Thames, nor can I hear any more about those birds which I suspected were Meruli torquite. As to the small mice, I have farther to remark that though they hang their nests for breeding, up amidst the straws of the standing corn, above the ground, yet I find that in the winter they burrow deep in the earth, and make warm beds of grass. 
but their grand rendezvous seems to be in corn ricks, into which they are carried at harvest. A neighbour housed an oat rick lately, under the thatch of which were assembled near an hundred, most of which were taken, and some I saw. I measured them, and found that from nose to tail they were just two inches and a quarter, and their tails just two inches long. Two of them in a scale weighed down just one copper halfpenny, which is about a third of an ounce avoir du poids, so that I must suppose that they are the smallest quadrupeds in this island. A full-grown Mus medius domesticus weighs, I find, one ounce, lumping weight, which is more than six times as much as the mouse above, and measures from nose to rump four inches and a quarter, and the same in its tail. We have had a very severe frost, and deep snow this month. My thermometer was one day fourteen degrees and a half below the freezing point, within doors. The tender evergreens were injured pretty much. It was very providential that the air was still, and the ground well covered with snow, else vegetation in general must have suffered prodigiously. There is reason to believe that some days were more severe than any since the year 1739 to 40. I am, etc., etc. End of Letters 7 to 13 to Thomas Pennant in Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne.